camera now. Maybe half of you don't don't know what we're talking about, but that was a very popular show back when we were, when AI was not a, a th an issue, when the internet was not actually a thing. Actually, candid camera was our the the most the fun thing that we had back in the day. So welcome everybody. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for for uh, spending uh, the next 90 minutes uh, with us, with the virtual facilitation crew. Fernando is not gonna be able to join us today. He's had a, um, a situation back home uh, in terms of medical issues. So he's not gonna be joining, probably will be joining later, but uh, hopefully everything's okay. So we're just gonna send him and his family just goodbye. So everything turns out fine in that part. Thank you for uh, again joining us. My name is Hector Villarreal. I'm currently joining from Santo Domingo, the Dominican Republic in the Caribbean. So for those of you that are in up north in the cold yeah. weather, my apologies. Yeah. My apologies that I'm just saying that I have a very beautiful sunshine out there uh, enjoying it today. So AI hallucinations, that's our, our, our session for today. We're going to be doing some work in terms of some do's and don'ts. Just to uh, let us know, I just would like to know who's who's in the room. Uh, please raise your hand or do it, you can also say it in the chat. Who of you, whom of you are using uh, AI, uh, either Bard or uh, Gemini or uh, ChatGPT at, in a daily basis? Please raise your hand if you're using it in a daily basis, every day, every day, okay. Susana, okay, so some of you are using it as a part of your everyday work. Good, thank you. So raise your, now raise your hand if you use it at least weekly, once a week. Are you using it once a week? Yeah, at least once a week, okay, no, no, half of it. Okay, um, just, and maybe in the last month, raise your hand if you're in the last month. Maybe once at least at least once in the last month, at least. So you said yes already it counts. Just want to making sure. Okay, thank you. So just a quick thing, Heather, what are you using ChatGPT uh, AI for? Oh, I guess I'm on. <laughs> um, actually, I often use it to make outlines. For outlines in terms of uh, your, your, your documents uh, and, and things like that. So I look for ideas for outlines on how to do it. Um, I find with chat GPT, getting something very specific isn't as helpful, but I find outlines I can, I have a good base where if I have a hard time getting started on something, an outline just helps me with the fundamentals and I can adjust and add or subtract as necessary. And in order to go. Thank you. Thanks, Heather. So, Louise, you also raised your hand. You said that you've been using it. What have you? Uh, is it the same usage as Heather, or is it a little bit different? Um, well, in part, I I have used it that way, but I'm uh, finding it to be a much better translator than uh, other options that are available especially going from English to French. Google is a disaster, while ChatGPT is, is actually very good. Um, I also use it as a something of a research base um, on things that you don't readily find on Google, like what's the positioning of this organization versus that one. Good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing, Luis. So we have some that have been using it on a daily basis, some that not as much. So we have a very a great variety. The goal for today's session is to give you a glimpse in, in terms of how to take advantage of AI, of course, but um, making sure that we are very aware of uh, the AI hallucinations. So are you familiar with what a hallucination is, an AI hallucination is? Yeah, okay. So basically a hallucination is when you get an output that is either inaccurate, misleading, or entirely fabricated. It's like, where did this come from, right? Um, 
even even though the AI might be trained in a in a in a specific or a massive amount of data that you're actually going to be using, right? So, um, what I'm going to do today is give you a, some tips, some tricks on on how to use it. When can actually we actually take advantage of AI hallucinations? And we're going to do uh, some practice. We're going to go out and play with some of the favorite tools that you've been using to actually make sure that some of the hallucinations um, are a little bit contained, or sometimes actually you you might want the hallucinate you might actually want hallucinations because you're sometimes you might be in a rut. You're just the group is just thinking in circles, and sometimes you need someone something to just push them out of the box and and think a little bit different, right? So um, where does hallucinations come from? So they come from uh, two spaces. Uh, one is that data bias or statistical noise. Where's that? What does that mean? Well, first, data bias is, uh, uh, it could be come, come from different ways. Uh, and I al always say that AI is only human. Why? How come? The thing is created by humans. So our biases are imprinted in what we design, right? So for example, uh, here in the Caribbean, uh, there, there's a very big design trend in terms of fashion, right? But if you think of Caribbean, what colors would you think of? Please, if you, you can put it in the chat. What, what colors do you think? If you think about fashion in the Caribbean, what things would you pit, put? What colors would you think about in terms of if there's Caribbean fashion, what colors would you create the uh, uh, orange, green, green, bright tropical, blue aqua, very bright, bright blue, range of reds and oranges. Quite. The thing is, what you're writing right now, it's actually a bias. Why should Caribbean fashion should be red or green or, uh, or, 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 or very bright colors? Why should it? Well, the thing is, our bias comes from our experience. And we've thought, we've been taught that Jamaican colors are very bright, for example, like the Jamaican flag. Or, or many others. So the thing is, AI is only human because it, uh, it's, uh, I would say it's a compilation of all the biases that we currently have as a society, as a, as a as profession and the like. So there are basically three ways or three sources of bias in AI that are the, the, the what, what creates our, uh, what creates the, the bias in, in, in the work that we do. And it's, one is trading, training data bias. Um, is it small? I think it's small. Let me see if I can make it bigger for you. Does it look better now? Is it better? Mm -hmm. Yeah, good, thank you. Yeah, and so training that data bias, it means, okay, what is the information that I'm putting into the system that's gonna create the AI model, right? So for example, if, if we put information in English, well, it might have some bias in terms of how English speaking persons work. And the thing is, uh, uh, words have meaning. And the thing is the thing is the uh, different languages have different uh, 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 dictionaries and have different meanings and stuff. So the thing is there, there are some languages that are more um, subtle, for example, that work more with context and there are languages that are more specific, right? So that training data bias can impact that a lot. Second is the algorithmic bias. And it means that the, the, the programmers might have done something wrong or might have inputted their weight, their, their weight, the, the weights of their, uh, the, uh, how they evaluate things in a specific way. Um, they would be in the programming. And the third one is the cognitive bias. Actually, we've, uh, we just saw that we had a cognitive bias towards bright colors when we think about Caribbean fashion. So if we, if we send um, uh, to the AI to create something with a specific uh, uh, fashion trend, it would go and, and look for those bi that, that information and would probably give us the same colors that you put there, right? So the, the problem with the, with the hallucinations is that they can create some issues. 
and those issues can be uh, quite quite complicated. For example, let me just give you some examples. Oh, I'm just sorry. I did I stop? Uh, let me just sorry. Uh, it seems that having a, a backup um, support always helps. But the thing is, as Fernando's not here, I'm trying to do everything myself. So some examples of AI bias that have actually impacted um, uh, real life examples. So healthcare. So um, so this is um, AI when they, 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 they try to use AI to uh, identify uh, 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 the, the diagnosis, right? With, 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 uh, so the computer actually checks all the all this uh, x-rays and uh, CAT sc uh, scans and all of that. And they realized that there was a, a predictive bias there when, when, with lower accuracy for black patients. Why? Because the input was, or the studies were only made in white patients. So there was a difference on the results, right? And that's important because it seems that there were uh, some black patients that were not diagnosed that actually were uh, we're having a, a health issue, right? Another one that could be, uh, that's actually, it's, uh, uh, this was very, well, I don't know if you follow Amazon, but there was very, uh, uh, when some, Amazon has so many applicants, they, they have thousands of applicants. Some of the big companies have not hundreds, but thousands of applicants for a single position. So what happens? So they use AI to try to scan through the CVs to try to get to pick the, the, the most appropriate candidates. So the problem is uh, the applicants were able to trick the system and they realized that using certain words would put you up the, uh, would actually put you in a higher position in front of others, even though you might not have all the qualifications. But the thing is the, the, the algorithm looked for words like executed or captured that actually uh, were, uh, were, were biasing towards a specific uh, uh, group of candidates in this, in this case, men, right? And the third one that I would like to, to just uh, share with you is, is in terms of, uh, uh, actually there's two of here, I'm sorry, I did the cover. Uh, one is uh, for the online advertising system, right? That actually they, they display more high paying positions to males more often than women, than to women. So actually, where someone was posting, uh, 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 reinforcing, reinforcing this this uh, role gender bias, and probably you saw you saw the in terms of image generation, the one that I have there as well. Then when they were creating images of people in some specialized professions, it showed both younger and older, but the older people were always men. So when they put successful, uh, so we, when you ask the image generation software to create, hey, show me a a successful person in uh, in business, they always put older men, white men, instead of uh, a generic person or from either other racial uh, background or even gender. So, so the thing is, I, as as I, as I mentioned earlier, AI is only human. The thing is, we have to to think how do we use this. Um, the, this knowledge in order for us to actually work better together with, with, with the technology. So do we have any questions so far? Sorry that I've been talking too much. I don't like to talk that much, but I think it was good to just give you a sense of where we are in terms of hallucinations and in terms of where it comes from. Go ahead, Heather. The natural language. Hmm. Yeah. The natural language algorithms i'm finding that a little interesting about kind of um i guess ways to beat that you know kind of beat that algorithm in certain cases so how are those so is that really a filtering impact or are there other impacts to natural language algorithms i'm, I'm curious about that well, one. well all, all these three uh, all these three biases impact natural language as well Okay. Not, not only analysis, but it also impact language. Re let's remember that um, 
AI is is a pre predict uh, prediction uh, software. It actually it, it tries to predict what you're looking for. So it, it looks for the words and start predicting what is the, the next word that's gonna make it higher for you to accept it. So it's been trained on acceptable uh, uh, proposals. Basically, they do a lot, and what they've they've done is. We have, they, they have a person that they start evaluating, hey, I like this, I don't like this, I like this, I, I don't like this. Probably if you've used ChatGPT prior, there's this thumbs up and thumbs down when you actually uh, type anything. This thumbs up and, uh, and, and thumbs down is actually, we're training their software for free. They're giving us examples and then, hey, if I like it, they say, oh, this was a better prediction than others. So what happens is that uh, it's constantly learning, trying to improve the probability that what they're they're putting out there is something of your liking, right? So the, it's not that they know, it's not that the AI knows stuff. They have access to a lot of information and a lot of probabilities. So it's a probabilities game. If, 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 if they propose something that you don't like, you can ask again and they, they propose something else and if they like it, they learn okay, th this has a, a better weight. So the next time I know what can actually work better for you, right? And actually that's one of the, for example, ChatGPT with their new uh, APIs and stuff that, that you can personalize your own, your own uh, AI. So, so it can adapt. And actually uh, with Copilot uh, in Microsoft is betting that they can know how your writing style is so they can propose a letter in your style of working. So, so we actually, so, so the thing is, um, there it's continually working and, and moving into that. But the the, the biases is going to be there, and we have to be, and but we're going to be working on that in a little bit. You 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 went ahead like fifteen minutes on my cal on my schedule, but that's good. Uh, <laughs> so I, I'm gonna I would like for you to to look at uh, a couple of uh, case studies actually. You will only, um, I'm, I'm sharing it in the chat. You can download it. It's, it's, there are some case studies. Uh, it's a Word document. They have, it has two case studies. I would like you to go into breakouts for you to go and, and, and discuss one of the cases. If you're an even number, you would use case one. If you're an, uh, Patty, even is par, no. Par, par es even o uh, impar, número impar en español, ¿cómo se dice? Estás... Sí, es even. Ok, so if you're an even number, two or four, you'll use case study in two. And if you're in uh, uneven, uh, if you're in group one, three or five, you're going to be using case study one. So I would like to you to go into... In, uh, in you would like to go into breakouts, read read it, and discuss. Okay, where did these biases of this come from? There's some there's some opportunities there. There's the, uh, there's some highlights in the in the case. But I would like you to go and discuss and then come back. Okay, just to reinforce what we've been. Okay, is that good? We're ready to go. We're gonna go ten minutes and then we'll come back. Okay, see you in around 10 minutes. Hello, welcome back. So how, how was it? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yep, okay, so just, to, just uh, I would like to ask uh, one of the key groups, what biases were you able to identify in case 31 on the new product ideas brainstorming? Uh, we have a uh, team number one, th three and five. Who, who would like to just share the thoughts? What biases were you able to identify? I'll, I'll pitch in. Uh, no. I was, no. yes, I was with uh, Nathalie and Selim. 
Um, and we had a great conversation in the sense that it, we were starting to brainstorm. Nathalie, uh, I think right from the start, announced her bias saying that she was actually working in the medical field. So she knew quite a lot about these technologies. So we didn't even think in terms of biases, but now that you're asking, I think that one of the biases might have been uh, the expertise, knowing oh, something yeah. very well from the inside for years brings her to this situation with a certain confidence and I would say a knowledge bias, if that it is. <laughs> And I did actually say, I yeah. I absolutely acknowledge I'm showing up with a bias. Um, <laughs> That's true. Because I yeah. was, you know, I've, I've come off a, a monitor for me measuring pressure in the brain after trauma traumatic brain injury. And I'm like, I know how hard that was, like to have a product that's measuring, measuring water intake or that's channeling fluids through the body, something that's doing something similar to try to get a commercial buyer to agree to what they would have to. So I'm like, oh my God, I'm doing it. I'm completely bringing decades of what I know about medical devices to a consumer product. And I would, I would absolutely send them back to say, give me more data. I need more data. How many consumers would be willing to be stuck with a pin um, throughout their body to make this work? Like, how are you measuring? So I totally saw my bias. It, and it's interesting because as, as Lars was saying, um, we have the knowledge bias is the thing is that we are might be experts in the field. But the thing is sometimes, and actually I've, I've done this reflection in my work as a facilitator is like, okay, what are my biases for this project? Yeah. Because sometimes it's, I think that I know. It's not that I know, I actually know things. I believe that I have. And the, the problem is that with Google at the, at the tip of our fingertips, we think we know everything because we just type, we get a result and say, hey, that's it. We, know, we, we now know about something. But as Natalie was saying, but we don't have the 30 years of experience in, in that environment that actually give us the, the, the wisdom is, I think that's when knowledge transforms into wisdom, right? To actually, we have to actually transform it and allow the, work, the the group to do it. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Laura. It's very interesting. And from from team uh, from the case study number two for the decision making tool, group two four. Anybody would like to just share? Come on, Don. Canwell or Patty from Miami Beach or Donna, Mary Ellen and Ruth. Okay, who would like to just share? So we couldn't figure out which group we were, so we also did number one. <laughs> so I can't help you with number two, sorry. Okay. So anybody, did any group actually did number two? Oh, go we ahead. did number two. Yes, yeah, Donna and Mary Ellen, please go ahead. Thanks. I was in a group with Ruth and Mary Ellen, and we were looking at um, case two and considering that. Um, um, so none of us had pharmaceutical experience, um, but certainly some experience with the tools like this and um, were concerned that there was a focus on the ROI um, and that the tool prioritized may have been focused on project management generally, but not really medical. Um, and so it was missing certain factors we felt were critical, um, such as ethics and the regulatory environment and so on, which really would impact um, the timing and whether or not that really you could achieve that staggering 300 um, percent ROI. Um, Mary, if I could just it, yeah, if I could just add to that, Donna, the whole aspect of clinical trials and clinical trials uh, are notorious for having um, just go bad. And so that you know, prolongs your timeline. And so it's hard to predict um, how easily or how slowly regulatory is going to take into effect. And, and then also highlighting what Donna mentioned about 300% ROI. I mean, there are some bean counters that are just going to look at that number and not be able to get beyond that period. The thing is 300 sounds so appealing, right? A 300 ROI for a business person, it's like, oh, 
they like that and they will focus only on that but not in actually is it actually is it doable so so thank you for your share for your sharing so as you can see there's a lot of things going on and maybe we're we're not using some of those specialized uh, type of uh, of ai but the thing is the ai that they were actually using that gemini dali um chat gpt they, they it has they have the same bias most of them. so we have to be make sure and, and sometimes even worse because they, they they've been trained in everything that's on the internet and the thing is not everything that's on the internet it's either real it's either actually factually based or anything like that so so we have to actually constantly double check so um uh, heather was asking hey how do i make sure that when when i come up with uh, from my work with with ai it's actually useful because heather was saying it's like it's good for outlines but not that much for the specifics right so there are certain things and i before we go with into the specifics i like to do uh, let's let's do something together let's let's make Ch chat gpt work for us so somebody does does anybody of you uh, i have an, a, a specific exercise that i can work with but i would like to uh, ask you first if do, do, does any of you have something that we would like to test chat gpt um right now that you would that you would like to, to ask for it and we can see it online Anybody would like to, look, to work with? Go, go ahead, Heather. I, I, I can see you. You're... Well, you know, often it's almost to provide almost like policy documents on clarity regarding something. Mm -hmm. So maybe how about something on using AI in the workplace? So let's ask AI how to use AI in the workplace. Or I don't have AI draft a policy on okay. the use of AI in the workplace. Okay. I see Mary right. Ellen has something. Go ahead, Mary Ellen. I'm just kind of curious about how AI could be used for soft skills like team building. Mm. Let's start with Heather's and then we'll go with yours, Mary Ellen. That's good. In the workplace. Um. One thing here is that for we have to think in the work you, you say it in the workplace, right, Heather? But as you can see, how how big is that question? Is it a big question, or is it a narrow question? Oh, it's big because I mean you could say that has three thousand employees that work no, in no, environmental wait. assessments no, or something. You, but no. yeah, it's it's broad. You, you have to. You have, you have to think how broad is your question for the AI because the AI is going to go and think about every workplace that there is. It's going to think about all the possibilities. So yep. we, we, when, when you're working with AI, you, you have to narrow it down, right? Mm -hmm. So we have to give them, okay, write a policy on how to use AI in the workplace for which kind of organization? Uh, well, we can say for, you know, that, is it, does is it team building is it, that does it, team building on behalf of <laughs> team building asking. consultants okay. maybe that okay or used by team. Uh, team building consultants consultants is that, is that right sorry for my want to so. specify the size of the organization okay Let, let's see what it does Purpose, definition, responsible AI use, transparent communication, data privacy and security, informed consent, bias mitigation, skill development, accountability and oversight. I don't know about you, but I think this policy is going to be very difficult to implement. Don't you think? Oh, no, no. You, you, you've had plenty of experience doing policies for companies and organizations and, and, and procedures and all that kind of stuff. Just from a quick look, after having a quick look at this, the thing is, this is something that can be implementable, something, or is just a generic policy. I, I think what it does is it allows people to bring every bias they have to how to apply this in the real world. <clears throat> and so even if you have this policy, it's so open to interpretation. And the interpretation is all based on people's perspective or biases. 
we won't have a uniform policy in actual life. Yeah. So actually, this policy would be good for, I mean, good to have it on the manual. So we can say, hey, we do have an AI policy, but that's going to be all that it's actually good for, right? Yeah, I was thinking so, something more specific when you asked about the scope of the policy, mm -hmm. something like an attendance policy for a manufacturing plant or something like that. Might can you repeat that? Can you repeat that? An attendance policy for a manufacturing facility. Okay. Let's let's see how let's see how that that works. And then I'm gonna work on it. Let's see. An attendance policy for a manufacturing company, you said? Yeah. Manufacturing facility. You have to actually be very careful with your grammar and with uh, your spelling, because actually, if you do misspell words, sometimes uh, AI might think that that is actually a word and look for it. So actually, you have to really take care of that. Of uh, three thousand uh, employees, that works uh, uh, twenty-four hours a day in. Eight hour shifts include possible um, penalties, you say? Not more than uh, 400 words. Okay. Do you see any difference from from the previous one to this one? This one's more specific. That one of the great things with with AI is that you can be as broad as you want or as specific as you want. The thing is, when it's more specific, you have a better chance the for the AI to actually nail it. So when you ask, "Hey, I want to do a, an outline for a session." with that 12 per, uh, group participant, uh, you have to be very detailed. You have to de detail it enough, but not overdo it. That's, a, that's a, a tricky balance. So you actually have to start looking at which ones actually work for you, which prompts. Actually, some of the people that work with uh, in prompt engineering, they say, save your prompts. The prompts that you put into AI, save it, and you have a, a, a structure and when, when you've developed a structure that works for you, you save it and you actually can actually reuse those prompts when, when, when it's actually needed, right? I feel like this also demonstrates a little bit of the difference between that soft skills versus something that's a little bit more structured. Like I think AI, it's easier to grab a hard and fast attendance policy for a manufacturing environment as as opposed to what Mary Ellen said I believe it was Mary Ellen which is how do you make something for team building there's so many different contexts to that even if you get specific about the context I imagine that takes a bit of a human touch I don't know if this is my bias it's just <laughs> step one. well let's let's design something together let's let's say we have to design um design uh, a an eight hour Hector, you know these days most people only get about two to four hours for team building. Okay, well, I'll go with that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, I have to admit, but the thing is, uh, some of my clients still have some eight hours, and I'm, I feel very fortunate that I still have them. Our uh, team building session uh, for a, a team that works uh, for uh, an accounting team. Team of a multinational and is it in person or <clears throat> virtual public uh, the event is in person and um, how about the culture of... is passive aggressive is there's a lot of passive aggressive people okay it's in person <laughs> and the current culture is uh, uh, uh identify identifies uh, current culture how, how about conflict avoidant 
that might be. Is conflict avoidant? So we need to. Uh, so we need. We need to be specific, right? Um, okay. I would also add the team's been working together for five years. Has been five years. Perfect. Uh, uh, include the create. Okay. Minute. Uh, one minute session. Including the topic of um, of effective conflict resolution. Let's see what it does. Uh, well, one of the things that I do love about ChatGPT is that it creates these really nice titles, at least. Okay, let's see. Welcome, an icebreaker. One of the things is it doesn't create actually the icebreaker. It just oh. tells you, hey, put an icebreaker here. So it's right? an agenda. Yeah. It, it, but it can. So you could ask a follow-on question. That's correct. One of the great things is that you can we can go into details. Thank you, Robin. Yeah. So Cultural exchange stations. Actually, that sounds interesting, actually. Anything else that catches your eye? Oh, by the way, this is more than so, four hours. So what are they using for uh, communication um, strategies? That was earlier on. Um, so it was I, after the cultural exploration. Communication styles is number three. So what yeah. are they actually using um, specifically to it talk about that? Yeah, no, you, you actually, yeah, you have to actually ask them, okay, what, what are the communication style that you propose, right? To the AI. Mm -hmm. So, but look at, there's here a, a very interesting bias. Is this four minutes, four hours long or, or is it longer? Seems a little longer. Actually, it's longer. You have a one hour, two hours, hour, three hours. Three hours. Actually, it's five hours. It's five actually, hours and six yeah, hours. 30. Six. Yeah, it's actually. So this is an AI hallucination. <clears throat> yeah. So one of, sometimes it's it, what happens is uh, when you put too many numbers mm -hmm. in it, it, it doesn't realize which one is actually the hour. So it actually messed it up. So let's let's do it a, a little bit different. Even though it says duration four hours. Yet yeah, it, it yeah, it yeah, it, it, yeah. So, so it's actually a hallucination, mm. right? Intra and that that also that happens frequently when you put a lot of numbers. Because the thing is, AI is trying to actually okay, which one is the number, and it's trying mm. to, but it actually messed up. Could so we tell it? Uh, could we one, tell it that it messed up and to recalculate yeah. the times and adjust mm -hmm. for four hours total? We all do that. only four hours. If we tell it it made a mistake, it'll apologize. I'm curious if it'll just shorten everything or actually prioritize. Uh, I would, I, I bet that it's going to shorten it. Mm -hmm. Now, actually, now let's see. It, it said one one hour. Yeah, I just shortened everything. Two hours. Yeah, actually, it, it's like four thirty. Four hours and thirty minutes now. Because there's thirty minutes for lunch. Yeah, mm -hmm. that's true. Which is another that's... bias that you have to eat lunch. Yeah, is that an eight to eight to twelve? Right. So let's go. Let's work with another one. And actually, what I'm going to do, I'm going to I'm going to copy paste the instruction, but I'm going to do it a different, a little bit different. And sometimes this is sometimes that I've used, and I think it's uh, for a team building session. 
using the rating structures for a team that needs to uh, increase their conflict management skills. When you give them, when you give the, the, the tool a specific set of, um, of framework of facilitation, it's a little bit more specific. Uh, I don't think it's 40 minutes still. Still over four hours. It's like, it's, thing. yeah, and actually it seems that the, the, the bias is that it's go, it has to be for a full day. Yeah. Use then four hours for the design. Please correct. <laughs> well, at least it, actually it apologizes, right? Yeah, but it still goes way overboard. 30, 30. So, so Hector, do, do you think there's a cultural three, bias four. in here? Because didn't you continue? Oh, you took the uh, Dominican Republic out of there. Never mind. Yeah, yeah, I took, uh, yeah, I took it out. But it, it, but when the thing is, it it still doesn't focus. It doesn't fit everything into four hours. Still, it's interesting. I don't think it has you know that sophisticated a filter to really look at that that prompt and then select, right? So it just looks at all that information and it kind of presents it to you. It's interesting because in the previous versions, I, I actually had done it and they were, it was pretty actually, it, it was pretty good actually. Mm. But now the, the thing is, one of the benefits here is that it goes into the specifics. It, mm -hmm. it gives you an icebreaker. Now it gives you an icebreaker. Why? Because I give them, I, I, give, I give a specific set of tools. Mm -hmm. For them so it's like it goes and looks okay what's a liberating structure and he looks into it them and then pushes them here so the, it, it's more useful sometimes right but what i find anyway. interesting is there doesn't seem to be a filter for almost human energy like this agenda looks exhausting yeah <laughs> well it definitely is yeah, probably more for, for a virtual environment so uh Go ahead, Savina, then not Donald. So I was just going to second what Kamal said, and that um, there's it, there it's underestimating how much time things take, no matter how big this uh, small the group is, and that people need more breaks. And I wonder, I was just going to wonder if that uh, that is that something that you could correct for. Like I don't know that if that's something yeah. you could correct for with a prompt. Yes, actually, you can say you can you, you can actually delimit. And saying, "Hey, uh, include." Uh, I would say, in, "Include." Uh, would include fifteen, a ten-minute break or fifteen-minute break. Every uh, and ninety minutes of work. Need extra activities that go over four hours. Uh, Kenwell, please, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I know. Uh, it seems that when you build on the previous prompts, it just seems to churn out the same information. But then from this, if you just select, you may have to be even more prescribed in what you're asking it to do. So, for instance, you could say, OK, um, can you use X, Y, Z liberated structures um, for a session of four hours? I, so I think you still have to refine your prompts. That's correct. Um, it's not doing it for you. Yeah. I mean, that's and, something that I've always had to do. I have to completely refine the prompts. Um, but yeah. then if it takes several refining prompts, then it completely loses its way. Um, so you almost have to start from a... So the prompts usually just help you to refine your prompts. It's just a bit like when you're doing a, any kind of, you know, when you're researching for, on a, a research, for instance, and your search engines you're using, you have to be a bit more, you have to be a bit more sophisticated because we all know you're already going to get out what you put in. So the hallucinations are just based on, yes, your own biases and your own level of expertise as well. Correct. 
Thank you. Can mm -hmm. we go ahead on? I was going to say, um, following. Oh, no, on sorry. No, uh, Don, Don raised his hand first, then you, Donna. Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking that one of the problems here is that it's assuming it has its own bias about what team building is and what the best methodology is for creating whatever team building means to it. I have a completely different view on team building and it doesn't include a lot of this stuff. So it's dangerous in that sense. Go ahead, Anna. I, I am actually going to repeat some of what was just said. Um, so my concern was that it's um, it's way too much. And I, I realize I've probably been in sessions created by AI and didn't know. It's like, there was just no, you know, recognizing that things yeah. always take longer, as was said before. And there's a, the need for breaks is not really, um, you know, regular breaks, given that kind of heavy, intense stuff is what you really need when you're building a team. And much more of those little, mini breaks so people can get to know each other outside of these formal um, team building exercises as well. So yeah, thanks. So so it's, it, go ahead, Marilyn. I think the other thing that the times that I've used this is um, just to get very rough agendas from like three different points of view. So put in three vastly different prompts and then work with that, um, knowing that there might be some biases towards uh, different things. So it's really an exercise to um, kind of spark my imagination as it relates to a session. Go ahead, Heather, and then Natalie. Uh, what I find really interesting is it's clearly intelligent, but I wouldn't say it's wise. Like just, you know, further to what somebody said is how I feel like I've been part of sessions that were created by AI. This is really the distinction between having the experience in doing something and also just getting a bunch of information to simply do it. And um, I think it's just an interesting way of looking at it because I know some of us may be in positions where we're hiring people and it's so easy, you know, to be, um, it's just so easy to be intrigued by, you know, the intelligence without necessarily the wisdom because that doesn't come across all the time. And I agree with Heather and Mary Ellen. Um, I have used Bard, ChatGPT. I've put in multiple phrases, using exclusionary criteria, et cetera. And I'll use three or four different versions because it's a first, actually not even a first draft. It's a crappy draft, but it's a starting point, you know, and starting with something is a lot easier than a blank page because it's so much easier to throw my bias on and see how wrong that is and fix it. So, but it's, um, also to everyone else's point so far, it's just way too much to do, you know, and and that is truly the difference. Again, another bias between a good facilitator and a great facilitator. We know to let the room do their own work, yeah. which is why the structures are liberating. That's absolutely true. So um, I, I just also wanted to, to share with you um, just for the sake of comparisons. One of the things that I do normally when I'm using um, AI is I use the same prompt in different platforms just to see what comes up. Mm -hmm. and, and, and actually that's that's what I've done right now. That, that's something that I do very often. I just have the, the good thing about having two big screens is that, okay, you use one and then you, so I, so for example, this is the, 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 on the left, this is ChatGPT 2.5. Uh, and this is Gemini, uh, Gemini, the, the the update upgrade from Bard from from Google. So this is very interesting because it 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 actually puts the materials before mm. that. It's something that I would do as a facilitator. I always put okay, what are the materials, and then I do the design. I don't know if you do that as well, but but this this is one of the fun things, and 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 uh, so. Let's see if let, let's see if Gemini actually fits to four hours only. 
So it's 15, 1, 115, uh, 130, 2, 230. Yeah, no, actually, it goes overboard as well, it seems. Yeah, it goes from. Only the lunch hour, I think, is over. I think it's five hours. Nine. <laughs> okay, let's see. Nine to, nine to two. So it's actually four hours plus, considering one hour lunch break. So it actually did it. Actually, it's actually four hours. The other thing that's cool is the additional tips. So look at that first tip: adapt <laughs> the session to the team's preference and needs. Yeah, for, for us that would be like. Duh. Yeah, but still, you know. <laughs> but actually, remember, this is the Gemini is thinking. I'm I'm talking to someone that doesn't know about anything, so I'll just give them just just for the for the sake of of uh, including some something extra, right? Uh, but I I would I wouldn't say that there's there's uh, I don't know if there's anyone that's actually develop, developing a facilitation AI. But I think it, it's uh, there's, I think Gemini. It's actually not that bad, I have to say. For example, it's asking, it's re recommending that you present a pre-written scenario based on common accounting team conflicts, right? Or have the team share past conflict anonymously, and then facilitate a discussion on identifying the root cause, the communication styles, and all. Actually, it's not that bad, I have to say. And it's asking you to put some building games, some escape room challenge. I don't know if an accounting team would actually prefer doing a escape room challenge. I don't know if you recommend it or the trust. Well, work. going up earlier, uh, Hector, it has a role play based on um, the scenario. Which one? This one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Gemini. So oh, yeah. um, there's a role play. Oops, now I can't find it. I'm oh, sorry. Curious. Um, yeah, right there. So you do the scenario discussion, then you do a role play, and then you debrief it. So yeah, it's actually pretty nice agenda. Uh, yeah, it's actually not that bad, huh? I can say from experience, I haven't met a single accountant that would not would hate that would love role playing. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I've had uh, mixed mixed feelings about doing role playing with accountants. I've had both ways, uh, so I wouldn't know. But one of the things that um, I don't know if you, have you seen uh, a session lab that now it has uh, AI as well. I don't know if you play with it. It's based on, uh, on, on, on ChatGPT. I think it's still in, it's in, in development, but it, it, it's interesting to see how it uh, proposes things when you give them a, a, niche, uh, a situation. So, um, so uh, any, uh, Robin, you can share about the accountants. Thank you for that one. You, you, you're a CPA, Robin? I yeah, I held my that. CPA for 35 years and finally decided I could just let go of it. Yeah, you, you I've changed been doing the facilitation for a long time, but I didn't want to let go of that <laughs> insanely so you, difficult. You changed your A from for an F. Exactly. <laughs> I, I I only have con one thing to say. Congratulations for that. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Role playing with lawyers is also fun. Oh, yeah, that's, that's, uh, it is fun. If you like, like a very hard, you know, like experiences, I would say, uh, if you're into like a, one of those very interesting, um, if, you, if you like to be like a stun double, that looks, that sounds like a very interesting option. As okay. long as they're role playing within their own group and they don't have to perform on a stage, it goes very well. Yeah. <laughs> Another option, and and I don't have it here, uh, but is is to provide the AI uh, when you're working with the AI is to provide an example of how you want the information to be displayed. That can be very helpful if you work in a certain way, 
or you propose things in a certain formatting, that could be also very helpful as well, right? So uh, some, some practices in terms of, of uh, hallucinations I wanted to share with that. People are just people, right, Robin? As you shared in the chat. Yeah. So, so some um, ways of mitigating hallucinations and some good practices like share. So, okay. One is set your expectations for the role of AI and it's your own expectations. Sometimes we want AI to do everything. And as Heather or someone was saying, it's like, okay, let's do the outline and then I'll work for that. As Natalie said, the blank page can be intimidating for us. So let's get rid of the blank page, putting something in it, at least make sure that the goal is there and then you can work with that. And it's quicker, right? Right, and um, uh, it's, it's very important to evaluate critically or always fact check the new, um, the new versions of Gemini, for example, you can ask them about uh, uh, do a fact checking. Can you give me the links? Bing as well with, from Microsoft. You can, if you ask, hey, the, which are, which is the, the source of that information uh, and for some fact checking. For example, I was doing this exercise on with uh, uh, man, a car manufacturing plant and I, I asked them, hey, how many parts are there in a car? And none of the engineers were able to tell me. And we go, we went with AI, and AI gave us, and they gave us the source and everything. So, so you can ask them the actual source, and that could be very helpful, right? When you go into facts, and um, obviously, it was oh, make sure that all the voices are heard, and you need to make sure if if you're using an advanced GPTs, for example, if you're doing your own GPT, maybe not 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 all of you, but sometimes some of your clients might be doing some AI that's specific. Okay, what's the inform? You need to train the the uh, the algorithm with with the what should be. You, what what it means is that what's on the internet, what is in a regular database, is not what it should be. It's what's in the news right now is not what it it should be, <laughs> right? Uh, we want uh, if you're creating an environment for the future, you want to make sure that the information. You have to be pre proactive in terms of what the, the data that's fit into the system represents everyone equally and without discrimination. That's very tough. It can be, it's much more difficult said than done because sometimes there is no information. For example, uh, there's much more information in English than in Spanish. For example, when I'm working with, uh, uh, so it's based in an Anglo uh, um, center point of view in many in many ways right so it's 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 very imp important to make sure that uh, you're really aware of that i mean do asking for something in english and then translating to spanish sometimes is not the, the way to do you actually have to do it in spanish to make sure that it actually uh, represents something culturally as well could be right and some of the don'ts um and it might sound uh how to say uh logical, but I, I've seen groups using AI for everything. Actually, uh, in a, in a, I was doing a, an, an event with, a, with not accountants, but, but controllers. Con controllers is the word, I think. Um, and they were using chat GPT for almost everything. So every, everything I told them, hey, they went back to the AI. And, and, and there was some times like, Hey, you have to stop and say, "Hey, you're the team is the one that's making the decision, not the AI." Because what's been happening is that some groups is like they don't take responsibility. It's like, no, it's what the AI told us to do, and we'll do that. So they actually kind of like um, and they 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 drop the responsibility, their their own responsibility on a decision, go uh, uh, focusing on 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 the system, right? And um, let's make sure that there's always some human oversight of the process, right? And, and, and I would say, if you're gonna use AI, make sure at least the, your group is, a, is aware of how AI works. Like this conversation that we're having, if you, for example, if a team is gonna use AI for strategic planning session or something, make sure that they understand what's, what are the underlying assumptions of AI. It might be 15 or 20 minutes that you need to actually just make sure that everybody understand that 
the, what AI, how AI works and what's in it. And, and, and just to make sure that they are using the AI responsibly. It's difficult because as Marianne was saying that people are shortening our times of facilitation. But the thing is, but but the thing is, I, I would say it's necessary to do it in order for actually the actual work to res to produce responsible results as well. It's one of those things that you actually have to work with. So, so, so. Also, um, and, and just uh, probably you've seen this before, and just a, or just a reminder, um, uh, just a reminder of the, are you familiar with the, the Sandwich Principle from? Uh, from from Alex, probably you've you've you you've seen this in our on our last year um, summer camp, and I always like to bring this back. Start with the human, then let the AI do some work and support the process, but then finish with the, the human, right? Do not start with the AI and not end with the AI. It's just, just an element of your design process. If you're using it, AI during a workshop, for example, make sure you always start with the, 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 the team doing the work, then the AI exploring ideas and uh, the, the participants using AI to, to explore and expand. And then the, the humans then taking that information and continue discussing uh, of, the, of the options, right? Right, just, just wanna make sure that um, I, I always like to remind this, I think is this from Alexander Asenfetter from, from Storms. He was the one who, who created this principle. And I think it's really, really helpful for us when facilitating and using AI as well. So any questions, any, any more ideas that you would like to share? Okay, I will take that, that as that you're thinking very hard on, on this item. Go ahead, Marilyn. Well, I think the other thing to keep in mind is that this is a rapidly evolving field. And, and so um, playing with it, um, as well as working with it, is going to be important because it, it, it just changes so quickly, the capabilities and the biases. Absolutely. Go ahead, Robin. Going off of that, and also, um, Hector, what you mentioned, I could see with a team that's planning to use AI to have them go through an exercise like what we just did, where you pulled up AI, you had people develop prompts, and then have them decide what's wrong with it. Not what's right with it, but what's wrong with it. If they lean toward believing everything AI, and then that might help them adjust their perspective. I do think that we have a bias towards uh, technology for the most part. And when it comes out from a machine, it's like, oh, then it must be true. So we have actually a, a bias towards believing everything that Google presents or whatever, it's, it, it's there, right? And, and it's difficult not to, because it's very easy. It's less time consuming, less energy. That so it's easy to just believe in the technology, whatever it comes out of it. So, so that definitely, uh, I think that exercise would be very, very, uh, very helpful for the process, Robin. Thank you. Uh, Don, uh, go ahead, Marilyn. The other thing that struck me as Robin was talking is the fact that there's a lot of things that um, use AI that are not chat BG and GBT, et cetera, you know, that just kind of influence the outcomes um, based on algorithms, et cetera, that we're not even aware of. Um, and so maybe becoming more conscious of those. Um, the reason I bring this up is the second scenario when they're using, um, you know, a uh, tool to prioritize things and the inherent bias of the algorithm that makes that up. So just being more conscious of 
where AI might be in things that even two years ago, it wasn't a part of. Yeah, actually, two years ago, we didn't know that AI existed, most of us. It was like something out of science fiction. Yeah, and and now it's like, oh, this is something that actually, actually helped me or helped the group that I'm working with. Go ahead, Sabina. Yeah, I just really resonated with the way Heather expressed it, like that intelligence versus wisdom thing. And whenever I have experienced, uh, I have very little, but whenever I have experimented with AI, I really get the feeling of working with um, like a junior employee you know it's a junior member of my staff they've just come in they're really smart and they need a lot of guidance so they are the folks who kind of do your initial idea building or your initial agenda building and gather information and present their thoughts to you and then you give them feedback and help them refine and I guess what I'm feeling right now is is pretty high level philosophical but I'm really wondering what's going to happen to like our kids who are you know now um, supposed to enter with this intelligence and gather wisdom. And instead we've got kind of a tool to do that for them. So yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Um, I, I think the, and just co continuing the, the philosophical conversation there, Sabina, is that uh, the next generations or our generation has a, a very big, uh, in a big, um, we're in a big uh, crossroad in terms of, okay, we have this great tool, but how do we use this great tool without impairing our own abilities of critical thinking, of actually knowing things? Because we need to still, we still need to know things. We need, still need to know right from wrong. We still need to do all these other things that, that are necessary uh, for us to live a healthy, productive life. And if just clicking and ask, and, and the only thing that you need to do right now is asking good prompts. Yeah. And I said, I don't think so, but still asking good prompts is a hard, it's hard work. Yeah. Interesting. Oh gosh, we're living so philosophically inspired or uninspired. I don't know what would be the word, but it's like, oh, too much, too much things to think about. So Heather, you, you, you were asking about, okay, how do we improve our, our prompting? Uh, as you were sharing, that was one of your questions, right? So I, I would say, um, it going to, into the details, and make sure that you give some context, not too much, but at least some context for the group. Uh, and, and also make, make sure that you give them a, a you, when you're prompting, you give the, a, a space of, of work, sometimes just a reference, a method reference. Sometimes the method reference can be very helpful, as you saw with the liberating structures. It can, it can give you more speci precise or specific. And then you start taking things in and out and start moving things around. That would be just my recommendation to continue working with this. So um, just for, because we, it is time for us to go. I would like to for for us to just say um, one thing that you take out of today's session, and I'll send it to Mary Ellen, and then you can send it to whomever you like. Trying something with AI at least once a week, whether I need it for something specific or not, just so I become more um, uh, familiar with its biases. And I'm passing it to Sabina. Uh, I think I'm I'm still very present to like what I just spoke about. So I think I'm thinking deeply about um, this outsourcing of of um, analyzing knowledge and critical skills and what the impact is going to be in the coming years. I will pass it to Donna. Can I say ditto? <laughs> I was just thinking about that because I have um, two kids, uh, young adults, and I was like, what? You know, how are they processing this? So they don't even know a life without AI. My young adult says, oh, I use it at work all the time. I started using it like two weeks ago. <laughs> so it's all work new for me. So yes, I'm, I'm definitely learning. I'm planning to try and experiment a little bit this week. So thank you for the conversations. Go ahead, Don. Donald. I was thinking that 
um, the large group's use of AI and its utilization of what is presented through that might lead to a degree of of um, consistency that isn't helpful. It doesn't create things on the other ends of the continuum that might break through some of the paradigms that we have. It's just something I was thinking about. Uh, and um, go ahead, Natalie, then Heather. So for me, it's just ongoing conversation of kind of the ethics behind AI and how I'm using it and where I'm using it and the need to check multiple places, even for a pre-draft of a draft. Um, but then I also found this absolutely hilarious little site with Seth Godin's writings where you can ask an AI trained on his voice to answer in his voice. And it and it's it's sounds just like him. So someday we may all have our own little AI bots on our websites. I don't remember who you said was going next, so I'll let oh, you I am. Um... Well, for me, I think, you know, and especially for my staff, artificial intelligence is not the same as artificial wisdom. So do the work. That would be my short advice to almost everybody who I'd work with on that. I go ahead, Paige, then Patty. Yeah, so kind of to both of those points, I really get stuck on the ethics behind AI as well. Um, but also as somebody who manages people, um, thinking like how that plays into effect with the work that's being done and how we're hiring people. And like, I think that's one of the key takeaways I didn't really think about before this is like, how is AI being utilized um, in replacement of knowledge in some situations versus in support of existing knowledge. So really kind of weighing that out and being able to determine which one is fully being utilized. Obviously we want in support of, not in place of. And then I could pass it to Patty. <laughs> There. Um, so for me, it just reinforces that it's just a tool, like just like a hammer is a tool or, um, and it is there to be used in this way. And the fun thing I'm getting out of this is I'm going to go uh, and click on the Seth's blog uh, link that Donald put up there <laughs> and uh, <laughs> see how that works. So, yeah. Uh, Bruce? Thanks for the session. This has been great. Um, I think uh, one thing that I'm going to take away is just how um, easy you made it look to try it out together. I think there's people are feeling um, that the AI train has already passed them by, and sometimes there's concern about um, biases and um, the impact or the negative impacts that sometimes covers up some lack of um, confidence or uh, willingness to try it. And so I really like how you led, led us through that. Let's just see. And let's just try it in a few different, uh, prompt, same prompt in a few different versions. And that can help demystify um, and give an opportunity to add the intelligence, uh, the wisdom to the intelligence in a really informal way. So thanks for that. Appreciate it, Ruth. Thank you. Thank you for sharing that. I, I just uh, put in the in the chat a couple of links in YouTube. One is for our YouTube page where all the practices are being uploaded, right? So um, all of, all of the all of you all of the things that you, we've seen here, it's going to be uploaded over there. And also, um, um, I, the last click link I put there, the YouTube is the summer camp that we did with Storm last year on AI for real with, with Alexander, it goes through the basics. So if you want to go through the basics, uh, Donna, you, you said that you were starting on this, that I think that would be very helpful for you guys. And and it, it's, it's, I mean, AI is here to stay. We need to know how to use that pencil 
as Patty mentioned. I mean, we it's just we need to make sure that we know how to use it, and it's just part of life nowadays. And uh, thank you. I really appreciate you joining us today in our virtual facilitation practice and hope you can join us for our next uh, events next, mo next month as well. And is anybody of you going to the IF um, conference in San Diego next month? I don't know if you are, but uh, uh, Fernando and myself, we're going to be there. Uh, we're doing a pre-conference workshop on liberating structures, a whole day, full day of practice. So in, in case you're around, please go say hello. And thank you all for joining us. Take care and uh, see you in the next one. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you.